good. It's working. Good. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. Uh, my name is Ken Yalowitz. I'm the director of the Dickey Center for International Understanding. And you can't hear me? OK. That's, that's exactly what I was going to do. Is this any better? No? Is this any better? No. Uh-oh. Yikes. Yes. OK. Hallelujah. OK. I just have to slouch here a little bit. but. Uh, uh, again, my name is Ken Yalowitz. I'm the director of the Dickey Center for International Understanding here at Dartmouth. Uh, and I'm delighted to welcome you to a very, very special occasion today. The Dickey Center's Great Issue Lecture Series pays tribute to Dartmouth President John Sloan Dickey and his belief reflected in the Great Issues course taught at Dartmouth for many years during his presidency, that an important part of a Dartmouth education should be acquiring competence in civic engagement and responsibility. He was particularly concerned that these competencies should include understanding of complex global issues. President Dickey was deeply concerned with United States foreign policy and the external problems facing our country. So it is very fitting that today we have with us one of the most outstanding figures in American diplomacy, Ambassador Thomas Pickering, to discuss the foreign policy challenges facing the United States. A career in the United States Foreign Service representing the United States abroad as a career diplomat is, as I can personally attest, fascinating, challenging, exciting, fulfilling, and sometimes dangerous. The Foreign Service is a competitive institution. All incoming officers want to become ambassadors and reach the highest levels of the profession, and all feel fully qualified to realize that goal after passing all the rigorous entrance exams and requirements to join the Foreign Service. In that very heady and dynamic environment, there are individuals who come to the fore and are recognized within the Foreign Service as embodying the highest standards of professionalism, diplomatic skills, personal integrity, and commitment to public service. In my time at the State Department, I was privileged to work for and with an individual who is regarded within the Foreign Service as the most outstanding career diplomat of the past quarter century. Mention the name of Tom Pickering to any Foreign Service officer in recent years, and the response uniformly is that he is the model, what we stand and strive for, and what the Foreign Service is all about. His exceptional diplomatic career was marked by strong country and regional expertise, but always the ability to see the global picture and how the various pieces fit together. He is valued for his vision, leadership, and management skills, and his strengths as a teacher and mentor. Tom Pickering served as the United States Ambassador to the Russian Federation, India, Israel, El Salvador, Nigeria, and the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan. He is also the former United States Ambassador and Representative to the United Nations and concluded his State Department career as Under Secretary of State for Political Affairs in January 2001. He holds the rank of Career Ambassador, the highest in the Foreign Service. In 1983 and 1986, he won the Distinguished Presidential Award, and in 1996, the Department of State's highest award, the Distinguished Service Award. 
Tom Pickering now serves as Senior Vice President for International Relations and a member of the Boeing Executive Council. In this position, he oversees Boeing's international affairs, including those with foreign governments. It is an honor and a great personal pleasure uh, to welcome Ambassador Tom Pickering to Dartmouth. <laughs> Thank you, Ken, for what was an embarrassingly laudatory introduction this afternoon and just goes to show that Foreign Service never learns the limits of hyperbola. <laughs> I'm delighted to be here this afternoon. It's a special pleasure to come and talk to you about some foreign policy challenges I've chosen because there's challenge enough there to speak about the Middle East this afternoon. And I'd like to discuss with you my perspectives on Middle Eastern problems of a special importance to us in our country at the current time. And interestingly enough, like the most important countries for a future American president, they all begin with the letter I. Israel and the Arab-Israeli peace process, Iraq and Iran. I thought I'd start with some brief thoughts on the continued importance of the region as a whole to kind of level set our discussion then I want to look at the challenges, but more importantly, some of the opportunities that I think are available to us and to the administration uh, as it looks out uh, over this series of difficult and challenging problems. We as a country and as a people, I think, need to be engaged in and pay attention to this region because of its significance for all the obvious reasons in strategic, political, and economic terms for us. The economic interests will have been apparent to all of you who drove here this afternoon as you looked at the prices at the gas pumps. And while they're down, uh, they're not where they used to be, and they reflect for us not only uh, the depredations of Katrina, but the uncertainties of the Middle East in that particular department. But there are other reasons, and I'll touch on some of those, and most important is the long and very difficult search for Middle East peace. Uh, the United States and its friends and allies have been bedeviled by this quest for almost 50 years. A conflict in the region, of course, infects our strong relationships across the region, not only with Israel and our commitments there, um, but with the moderate Arab states and the other participants in the peace process with whom over the years we have attempted to build a relationship of trust and confidence, which if anything is under some serious stress at the moment. Terrorism comes to us at the moment, at least in one form, uh, the interest of Islamic fundamentalists in propagating their thoughts and ideas through this medium and this tactic. I think we have to look deeper, and some of the basic causes and disagreements are obviously the product of American policy in the region, as well as the impact of social, economic, religious change and controversy there. And finally, the health and security and stability of our allies and friends around the Europe, many of them located much closer to the Middle East than we are, is determined much by what will happen as well as what has been happening there. I want to begin first with the Arab-Israeli peace process, certainly the longest running problem with which we have been associated in the Middle East. After a number of years of seemingly mindless violence in the region and beyond, we've come to a new step one that has, in my view, the beginnings of some potential for opening the gates for progress after a long time. Israel's disengagement from Gaza, the withdrawal of settlements led by Prime Minister Sharon, has been a serious contribution and a step forward for the region. It's not necessarily a new idea, not an exclusive preserve of his. But as we have seen, within a few days, this difficult task was accomplished with the cooperation and not the opposition of the Israeli military. And as we have also noticed, or may not have noticed, it was a period in which there were very few violent terrorist actions undertaken on the part of the Palestinians. This was true in large measure because of a strong commitment of the new Palestinian leadership to do what they could to avoid having the process blown out of the water uh, by violence initiated on their side. Palestinian support has not been perfect but it has been a cogent step 
forward, and we need, obviously, to be aware of that. There are also some other hopeful signs when we look at the Middle East as compared with a year ago when there was no progress escalating violence and increased intransigence on both sides. In this regard, uh, the world in a strange twist of history and fate owes something of a debt of gratitude to Prime Minister Sharon, a certified historical hardliner. He has adopted a view that is quite different from his traditional pattern of dealing with the problem. Over the years that I've known him, I found him genuinely interested in a resolution of the problem, albeit on his own terms. However, it wasn't until he declared his interest in disengaging from Gaza that I thought there was the beginning of any real opportunity for this interest, his professed interest on his part, in becoming a reality. Personally, I quietly and privately set the test of his interest as to whether he would, in the last analysis, continue to support disengagement in Gaza, even at the risk of losing the support of his own political party. This indeed has been the case, and Sharon has lost, probably conservatively speaking, two-thirds of the vote of the Likud, the membership of his own party. Indeed, the ratification of that view is the fact that his traditional opponent in the party, former Prime Minister Netanyahu, has now come forward to declare his readiness to take Sharon's place. Sharon recently won inside the party a vote to postpone the election uh, of a new party leadership against Mr. Netanyahu, but it was a very close run thing. He won by about 50 votes out of 3,000 voting party leaders. Israel and the region will face important problems in the days ahead. The most significant of these will, whether this step, will be whether this step has been a one-off one-time Gaza-only effort, or whether in fact it will and can and must lead to further steps, whether it will lead to further steps which will end in the development of peace based on two independent states in the region agreeing together on the details of a peaceful settlement is the key question. In Israel, there will be an election at the end of February, something that was resolved yesterday. It's an election and the circumstances surround it that lead me to believe that there is still some reason for hope that further steps can be taken. In effect, one way or another, Sharon can succeed to and stay in the prime ministership only if he remains committed to further peace efforts in the West Bank and beyond. In a sense, for after Gaza disengagement, he's become a prime minister without a party for several parties without a prime minister. He is still the most popular politician in Israel. Whether he will be in February remains an open question. But without that commitment on his part, the electorate that has developed a strong position in favor of him is unlikely to be uh, in favor of him at the election time. So far, Sharon, interestingly enough, has so shown no signs of retreating, nor any interest in turning his government over to former Prime Minister Netanyahu or to the new Labor Party contender who just this last week replaced Shimon Peres, a man by the name of Amir Peretz, who comes from the Israeli labor movement. This doesn't mean that the future is easy or wide open for a peace settlement. Sharon's own ideas about borders of the two states will probably be very far from what the Palestinians and the U.S. may be thinking about those borders. However, the irony is that the basic elements of a peace settlement are, at least in the minds of those of us who've been dealing with this for a long time, and on all sides, closer together today than they have ever been before. Sharon will have to make tough decisions, but he is obviously the Israeli leader at the moment best equipped to bring the country to a peaceful settlement, and I never thought I would ever say that from a public platform. The basic terms of peace are also, as I said a minute ago, now well understood. Jerusalem would have to become the capital of both Palestine and Israel. And Jerusalem would be divided, at least between the two states, along the lines which were proposed formally by Prime Minister Barak, with the Arab areas going into Palestine and the Jewish areas staying within Israel. But hopefully it will somehow, through diplomatic uh, 
capacity as yet unforeseen remain an open city. That doesn't mean that there aren't other hard problems to solve. In security terms, the new Palestine would be a demilitarized state, uh, but with its own strong police and security forces and necessarily engaged in cooperation with Israel in dealing with security issues. The difficult problem of refugees will also have to be resolved. While Israel remains intransigent uh, and uh, quite adamant about returning any uh, refugees to the state, even a token return, in my view, would help to resolve the problem of establishing a right, uh, but a very limited one, to make that happen. The bulk of the Palestinian refugees, we all know, will have to be resettled internationally and some allowed to move into the new Palestinian state on the West Bank and Gaza. And finally, the question of drawing the borderline remains unresolved. There is a strong view about that through a combination of land trades and the development of other positive conditions, a Palestinian state can be set up which will nearly approximate most of the land area currently under occupation by Israel. That probably, again, will be difficult to achieve. But one way or another, it is likely to form the only basis that I can see for a successful approach to the problem. My optimism here, and it's very limited, may also be misplaced. There are all kinds of unexpected and untoward things that happen in the Middle East on a daily basis. And Israel is certainly the most volatile political society that I have ever had the privilege to, to see or live in. Sharon has brought a new approach and some new potential for success in the region. He will strongly require the support of the international community and the United States to achieve it. Similarly, Mahmoud Abbas, the new president of, Palestine, of the Palestinian Authority, has shown himself increasingly a responsible leader and someone who, at least among Palestinians, can begin to deliver on their side. He will need a lot of help more development projects to provide employment. He will have to reform and improve governance for the Palestinians. He will have to find new ways to improve security. And he will need help, as he received from Secretary Rice last week, in providing access in and out of Gaza for trade and for the movement of people. And finally, he will need Sharon's help to assure that the process will continue sooner rather than later. Much of this remains in the hands of the Israeli electorate and what Mr. Abbas can do. But a great deal is also in the hands of the United States, which has always had to play a significant intermediary role to get these processes moving. This combination has rarely arrived in the history of Arab-Israeli conflict in the region. And it presents us all with significant challenges and some opportunities for settlement. Needless to say, a peace settlement would make its own contribution to stability and progress in a region also riven with other, other areas of strife and conflict, and the U.S. will always, as I said earlier, need to be there. Now let me turn to Iraq, something which is daily on our minds. We cannot escape the obvious ongoing crescendo of attacks on our forces and on many Iraqis by the insurgents in that country many of whom, of course, have been involved in terrorist incidents in their operations. It is also true that the fundamental problem in Iraq today is not the issue only of governance or how to integrate the country. It remains fundamentally still a major problem of security. I'm not going to spend time with you today to go over the recent history of U.S. involvement in Iraq. Each of us has formed our own views on that particular subject. I can only say that mine are woefully non-laudatory. What I would like to say is that Iraq still presents both a serious challenge and something of an opportunity for us for the future. It's a particularly serious challenge if we do not help the Iraqis gain security and develop new methods of governance and become effective in producing oil. This is an opportunity because over a period of time, we have a better basis for helping to develop a more democratic and open form of government. Certainly, my, envision, my view here is not a Swiss democracy, but a big improvement on Saddam Hussein and some progress on where we are now, as well as a prosperous economy for the people of Iraq. The challenge most pertinent for us ahead 
continues to remain the issue of security. And it is unlikely, in my view, to be resolved without a significant increase in Iraq's own capabilities to deal directly with the security question. This cannot be developed without American, and I would say well beyond that, international assistance, something that has not yet happened. And it is not likely to happen quickly, as we have seen. And the strategy of those who attack us in Iraq and who attack Iraqis is clearly to do everything they can to prevent the effective development of security and stability in the days ahead. In addition to dealing with the question of security, the Iraqis have made steps along the way toward developing a governmental mechanism for themselves for the future. The approval of the Constitution uh, was, <coughs> was had Iraq voting for another step forward. And, and while there are questions, obviously, about the electoral process, most have now accepted it as a conclusion. Uh, these steps have been important and probably necessary. But in my view, they should not be taken as sufficient to deal with the underlying issues, and particularly the security problem, as we, I think, have a tendency to assume that once Iraq has a government, uh, everything is resolved. I think we need to be careful in questioning that set of assumptions. The next step, however, will be the election of a new government on December 15th, and that will, in my view, mark a step forward, but only that. Certainly, all the steps that can help to build Iraqi resolve, streamline and make more effective and efficient its government activities, and strengthen the commitment to developing security forces will be important. And here I would add that I think that we are taxed uh, by the problem of a serious lack of viable intelligence about Iraq, both in our part and on the, among the Iraqis. And after three years of military presence, I think we need to undertake as a serious proposition that great improvements have to be made in that part of our activities to meet the challenge of security. It's also important in the days ahead for us to give more consideration, certainly than we have in the past, to bringing the international community, and particularly those from the region, into the future of Iraq. Certainly some now and beyond those who are already engaged uh, don't show any significant interest in becoming involved, particularly in the security area. Nevertheless, I believe a new effort, uh, starting at the bottom, is worth trying to increase international participation. One way to do that is to turn our present policies around and begin to bring our allies and friends in in a consultative arrangement, perhaps the establishment of a small contact group among our leading friends and allies to share ideas and plans and to share decisions to help to meet the threat. Certainly, nobody is going to be interested in playing with us in Iraq if they are not there and part of the decision-making process. They are unlikely to be with us if the decision-making continues to be purely an American affair. Also, many are willing to help in training Iraqi forces in improving those forces' potential for de dealing with the security threat. These, I think, need to be accepted and encouraged. It's also important that the rest of the international community become engaged in dealing, perhaps beginning in the presently secure areas, with the development and rebuilding of the country. They have great possibilities, and that will be important, but it clearly requires a fundamental change in the approach of the United States to this issue if we are going to see any real participation of friends and allies in the solution. Finally, I, I believe that greater international participation in support of Iraq in the future will have a psychological and political impact inside the country. Those who oppose us do so because they believe we're an occupying force, and at the moment we show every signs of being one. Were we to internationalize the effort and perhaps begin to reinforce for Iraqis that at the right time we will withdraw, we will begin to put an end to the simplistic anti-American thinking in Iraq and in the region and in the world at large. It won't happen overnight, but I think it can begin. It will also help Iraqis who are supportive of their own future uh, to know and understand that rather than oppose them uh, as surrogates for the Americans, the world community is backing them in an effort to seek a future for their own country. This can only encourage those who believe in a rational and national future for Iraq and discourage those who believe 
that, in, that terror and assassination and disruption are the keys to their future success in the country. In Iraq, interestingly enough, we seem to be dealing with an insurgency that has not yet formulated a political program. Informal contacts with some insurgents have apparently begun. They too can be useful in defining a political program and perhaps bringing in some of these insurgents, including the nationalists and others, whose interests are perhaps more congru congruent with the political future for the country as a whole. We can infer that the insurgent program is probably designed in the main to try to force us to evacuate, uh, but we should be, in my view, cautious about evacuating prematurely. A premature evacuation, in my view, certainly, I think, would lead to a factional civil war inside Iraq. Many have said, of course, that we already have a factional civil war. Although staying the course, in my view, could help to lead to the effective development of a central government and some outreach and significant local participation in achieving the kind of balance that will be necessary for a unified Iraq to go, to go forward. Uh, were we to leave prematurely, I also believe that a civil war inside Iraq has very little chance of being confined to the country as a whole. It is likely to be internationalized rapidly. The key neighbors, Iran, Saudi Arabia, Syria, and Turkey, all have shown great interest in the future of Iraq and would be unlikely, in my view, to stand aside of a civil war without engaging themselves, certainly in support of one or another or against one or a number of the sides in a civil conflict there. So Iraq presents huge challenges and many opportunities. Our friends, particularly Europe and the Arab world, regardless of how the process started, are now saddled effectively by what it's with whatever the outcome is. It's on that basis that we need to do more to encourage them to become supportive and involved in helping us develop a solution which both we and they uh, can live and, and obviously uh, be proud of. Now let me turn to Iran and the difficult problems it poses for our country and for the world as a whole. Iran underwent a sea change in its outlook and attitudes in the revolution of 1978. In the ensuing almost 10-year war between Iraq and Iran, some of those positions and attitudes inside Iran were hardened and made more intractable. Since the end of the Iran-Iraq war, it appears that Iran has begun to engage itself in an effort to acquire nuclear weapons capability. It's this latter point, the apparent Iranian interest in this kind of activity and its development that has given us the most difficult problem to face today. Iran, going back to the days of the Shah, had a focus on the development of nuclear power. And while Iran is well endowed with hydrocarbons, the view in Tehran has been that they would prefer a diversified source of electrical power. They say that nuclear can provide the answer. They also say they wish to preserve their petroleum and gas for high export earnings rather than domestic use to generate electricity. And they maintain that the conversion of petroleum and gas to electricity is not only wasteful from their perspective, but environmentally damaging. All interesting arguments. The United States has tended to deprecate these arguments and say that the Iranian interest is solely in acquiring the capability through their civil nuclear arrangements uh, for a nuclear weapons capacity. Whatever the truth, the United States and our European friends have continued on an increasing basis to share the concern that Iran seeks to develop the civil power option as a basis also for moving to nuclear weapons. This has been heightened in part by the secrecy around Iran's program and in its dealings with the International Atomic Energy Agency of the UN, who has at least shared in part some of the conclusions about the direction of the Iranian program. And for any of you who read last Sunday's New York Times, you will see at least the evidence that has been adduced in public on this particular issue. The concern has been that in two processes, which Iran would like to claim for itself, are exclusively for civil purposes, they can also develop the central material for nuclear weapons. One of these, the enrichment of uranium, and the other is the separation of plutonium from previously used nuclear reactor fuel where plutonium is built up as a byproduct of nuclear energy production are particularly sensitive. 
Iran belongs to the Non-Proliferation Treaty. The treaty, I emphasize, does permit Iran, under safeguards by the International Atomic Energy Agency, to engage in these two processes. Since the treaty was formulated, the international community has been increasingly concerned that states will, use, will develop these processes, then withdraw from the treaty, and exploit their knowledge of these processes and the equipment they have for nuclear weapons purposes. This has clearly uncovered a loophole in the minds of most in the treaty itself. Currently, three major European states, the UK, France, and Germany, have been negotiating with Iran to seek a commitment by Iran to end these processes under international inspection. In return, the Europeans would broadly support, among other things, Iranian civil nuclear power development. Iran has refused to accept the additional restrictions. It claims it wants to be fully independent in its nuclear power production, even though it claims it has no interest in nuclear weapons. Unfortunately, Iranian secrecy about its program in the past and other information which the U.S. government says is reliable has led it to conclude, I emphasize along with our European allies, that Iran wishes to go in the direction of setting itself up as a military nuclear power. Recently, talks between the Europeans and Iran broke down, and Iran has reopened a facility designed to achieve some early steps in the process of uranium enrichment, the conversion of uranium to a gas as a feedstock for their enrichment program. <coughs> After the breakdown in talks, there was agreement in the Board of Governors of the International Atomic Energy Agency of the UN that Iran was in violation of some of its obligations under the NPT. This has led, in this past week, to statements from Iran that it is now ready to resume negotiations on a basis apparently negotiated with the help of the Russians, that while some conversion will take place in Iran, enrichment for Iran's civil nuclear program will be done elsewhere, most likely in Russia, and that Iran will have the opportunity to invest itself in that particular program. Under the Non-Proliferation Treaty, if Iran were to be found in the future in default on the treaty, the Board of Governors of the International Atomic Energy Agency would next consider referring the matter to action for the Security Council. The Security Council of the UN could impose sanctions on Iran, although there are doubts these days as to whether China and perhaps Russia would currently support such steps. The Europeans have made it clear that if Iran does not proceed with talks with them, they are inclined in the direction of Security Council action, although they have been reluctant to be specific about what steps they are prepared to take. All of these pressures may have helped in one way or another, momentarily at least, to restart the talks. The United States has remained in the background in the negotiations on the basis of long-standing differences over Iran, and the views of some, at least, that the only policy to pursue with respect to Iran is regime change, and that any discussion with the Iranians is a legitimatization of the Iranian regime. There are many outstanding problems between the United States and Iran coming out of the history of our relationship since the revolution of 78, including the hostage crisis. Many also think, however, that it is time for the United States and Iran to begin to talk, as well as to open up opportunities for change by having the U.S. become more directly engaged, not only with Iran, but with the nuclear conversations. It is not uncertain yet that Iran would be willing to accept this. The Iranian ambassador in New York said uh, last week uh, that for the first time, uh, Iran and the United States were ag in agreement that they were not ready to begin talks. In the past, it has always been one ready and the other reluctant. In addition, it would seem important to the United States and Iran to begin to engage, as I said, not only on the nuclear issue, but also on the bilateral problems and perhaps on some of the regional questions that are important for the future. In the past, uh, George Shultz, when he was Secretary of State, used to tell us all that we were at a deep hole, we should stop digging. Well, this is one of those issues and some of these additional efforts that I'm talking about, I think, could help us uh, widen the possibility for negotiations rather than to continue to narrow it. Another suggestion has been made that the nuclear powers might, in a regional security context, 
give Iran and the other states in the region guarantees against threats uh, by nuclear powers against any of them. Certainly for Iran, only if Iran were willing to give up nuclear weapons, uh, and including uh, not entering into enrichment and reprocessing. For other states in the region, it has been suggested that if, in fact, uh, such a process can be undertaken, this might well help, even if proliferation efforts were to fail, to assure states in the region that, in fact, the rest of the world community uh, would be with them in the event of nuclear threats. Uh, there are other suggestions as well uh, to add carrots to the negotiation, if I can use that old diplomatic phrase, including the possibility uh, that uh, the Caspian Sea uh, oil production might be opened up for swaps uh, with Iran so that uh, Iranian oil could be exported uh, to uh, cover uh, Caspian Sea production, which the Iranians themselves would use. And in addition, that the United States might, in the context of successful talks, drop its opposition uh, to a gas and then maybe later a petroleum pipeline from Iran to India and Pakistan uh, to meet their growing energy needs. Finally, if the talks were to make pro progress, there should be a, a new opportunity, as some have suggested, to develop an international method of guarantee, assu guaranteeing assured nuclear fuel supply, and by taking back spent nuclear fuel containing plutonium, which Iran now wishes to handle exclusively for itself. The Russians and their proposals uh, to build uh, and support a civil power reactor in Iran have made those conditions for Iranian conduct with respect to the reactor. If the rest of us, in fact, are engaged in and committed to an international nuclear fuel support project, and the actual production of fuel is limited to those few who now produce it, but with an absolute certainty of other states receiving fuel and sending back spent fuel, this would be a major step forward. It would be important not only for Iran, but for other countries in the world interested in safe and secure nuclear power. Whether these additional steps will be taken and accepted in a negotiating process depends on many uncertainties. A new, more conservative president has been elected in Iran. His public uh, statements on the nuclear issue and indeed on other issues have not been encouraging. Uh, the bulk of the power, however, still remains in the hands of the conservative clergy. While they have shown an interest in talking with the Europeans about nuclear issues, they have become remarkably intransigent about taking any steps that will limit their potential to achieve in the long term a military nuclear capacity. We perhaps will have one or two more major negotiating efforts left in the diplomacy. After that, one can see only down the road clearly sanctions on the horizon. In addition, the United States has not given up the military option. Most believe that that would be limited to aerial attack on military targets. Were we to do that, it would have a negative impact in Iran, where Iran, in Iraq, I'm sorry, where Iran plays a role, and in my view also on the widespread popular support that the U.S. enjoys, interestingly enough, among the Iranian public. And so I thank you for your time and attention to a long presentation on a number of complicated subjects, and I thank you for in your interest in coming, and now I look forward very much to your comments and to your questions. respect for the situation on the ground has only the effect of replicating the problems of premature withdrawal. Uh, were we, in fact, to adopt guideposts, which are always hard to define, <laughs> that might be, I think, more helpful. And as I said in my comments, I think we need to make it very clear that we have no permanent interest in Iraq. 
Uh, I think that that's one that so far the administration hasn't stepped up to, but I think over time it will need to, as part of what I think is creating greater confidence in the region and beyond uh, that our interests in Iraq are what we say they are and not something broader as people who don't like us in the region allege. No, I'm not, and uh, I'm, but I'm not surprised to hear it because I think John Murtha's background and interest in the armed forces, and in fact the pounding that the reserve element is taking now, as well as obviously what's happening to our armed forces in Iraq is something very much on his mind. I can only conjecture, because I haven't seen his statements and I didn't know until you raised it in your question, and this is always dangerous, but I can only conjecture that might have been one of his motivating factors. Well, this isn't the first time I've given this speech, and I've seen absolutely no reaction. Not that I would expect one. <laughs> Secondly, I think that um, in Iraq, Tom Friedman's pottery, pottery barn uh, aphorism holds, if you break it, you own it, in a sense that we have a tremendous amount of responsibility for what's happening there. Um, the, frankly irresponsible way in which we got in and then conducted ourselves, particularly after the military operation, uh, if it's complemented by an early, irresponsible early withdrawal uh, with what I think are the difficulties that lie out there uh, means in fact that we are accepting uh, both huge risks and in my view significant disruption uh, in the world community. Uh, you can say, and I think that there are people who are right in saying that a number of things we've already done have begun a civil war. And you only have to look at Shia prisons and local militias, which we are supporting, uh, as adding to that. Uh, and I wouldn't recommend that we continue doing that. Uh, I think that a civil war in Iraq, in my view, as I said in my prepared remarks, is not containable in an international sense. And then we can only, I think, imagine what the ramifications of that would be, uh, both in disruption in the region uh, and the involvement of a lot of individual states in the region, not all of whom are getting along well together, and I think the potential for disruption, obviously, of energy resources, uh, which many people think we went in uh, to try to avoid. So I think the consequences of getting out prematurely are fairly stark and fairly clear, and the bet uh, that Iraq will march calmly and peacefully off into a Hollywood-like sunset uh, is about as uh, fatuous as those who thought that uh, we would be there three months, that it would be rose petals and palm leaves, and that we would all turn it over to Mr. Chalabi and go home. If, as seems likely, uh, extended time in Iraq well lead to uh, more revelation, more episodes of abuse of power, more episodes of abuse of, uh, of retreat from international understandings, uh, uh, and so forth, or even just more re revelations of already existing episodes. How much of that erosion, uh, how, how long can the United States tolerate that kind of erosion of its image in the world where does it become no longer worthwhile, I guess? Uh, so, because it seems to me likely that, that every year spent in Iraq will bring us at least one or two yeah. new revelations of shame to the United States. I, I'm not certain I would join you in the notion that we are so ineffective and so bad as a country in dealing with foreign policy and security situations that we should become a hermit kingdom. 
but I think that's the end result of what you've got. It's isolationism through uh, uh, incapacity or ineffectiveness. And I'm not sure that that's a formula I would accept. And you have to say how long will it go on. I suppose at least one benchmark is the American electoral calendar. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, there's something that we don't seem to be doing in Iraq, we don't seem to be doing in Israel, that we're very good at doing if we'll only do it. What I'm talking about is creating a vision, say, in Iraq, for the Iraqis of what could happen. That is, when peace comes, there will be a tremendous amount of reconstruction that will have to be done. When peace comes, there will be development, for instance, of oil and maybe of agriculture. On the Israeli side, the Palestinian side, if we could give a vision of when there are two states, there used to be economic benefits. If Israel, if Jerusalem is internationalized, there used to be the benefits people would come from the Muslim world, the Christian world, and the Jewish world to see what might be sort of a Vatican, Vatican State type of place in central old Jerusalem. Why are we doing this? Why don't we create the vision? I think in part we've wanted to have people create the visions for themselves. I think in part creating a vision is perhaps a necessary but not sufficient condition for success. I think a vision without the backup plans and activities that have to be undertaken uh, is a vision doomed to failure. So that we need to operationalize the vision as well as to help create it. I'm not sure that's totally our responsibility, but we certainly bear in Iraq a large share of responsibility for where it is now. Uh, and my view, as you saw from my prepared remarks, is that we need to do everything we can to help the Iraqis and empower them first and foremost to find their way out and to try to find a way to get the international community to take the kind of role in this process that would be worthy of their participation, if I could put it this way, uh, to help move the thing forward. I don't see any other sets of alternatives except perhaps prematurely running away or continuing to stay the course. The former, I've told you, I don't think presents a viable solution. I think the chances, as I say, of a millennial Iraq emerging from an early American withdrawal is pretty negligible. And I think with respect to the latter set of situations, I've tried to present what I think is a set of diplomatic opportunities for the United States. The real difficulty is the United States ready to stop digging in the old hole and find something new to do. Um, it often seems Israel does things that are not in the U.S. best interest. Why don't we use our leverage with them to greater effect? It's a great question. Having been ambassador in Israel for three and a half years, I daily ask myself <laughs> that question. The issue, the, the question is, I think, very simply, uh, that there were many things that we did ask the Israelis to do, and some that they actually did. And many things they said, no, it's in our interest to do something else, and that's what we're going to do. Uh, I think that their persuasive capacity in the United States is large in this particular area. Uh, and I think the United States has been respectful of where the Israelis are. Maybe not in our own best interest over a period of time, uh, but that has happened. As ambassador in Israel in the summer of 1987, uh, I gave a speech. Uh, and in that speech, I said uh, at the Hebrew University uh, a single sentence that the Israelis really needed to pay a great deal more attention to how they treated the Palestinians, or they would, in effect, be reaping something of a whirlwind at the end result. With absolutely no foreknowledge, and certainly with no instrumentality on my part, in December of that year, the first intifada began, and I think in large measure because of those concerns. It was fascinating because I think the United States tends to overestimate uh, the unity of Israel on these particular issues when I give that kind of advice against us. I got letters from all over Israel saying people thought I was correct, and this was the right thing to say. I got one very outspoken, very right-wing Israeli politician 
who said that I was an unfriendly ambassador of a friendly country, the nicest compliment I'd been ever been paid. <laughs> to what extent did the passing of this act of being contribute to the current situation? That's a great question. We can always see great men disappearing. And what, to what extent did the disappearance of Yitzhak Rabin contribute to the present situation? I think if you want to go back and rewrite historical fiction on these issues, it's a great source of uh, dismay and concern. Um, because at the time, uh, it was very clear that he and his old protagonist, Shimon Peres, uh, who were in effect con contending for ideas about how to move forward, and each borrowing from the other, uh, were already moving on a path that I think perhaps could have escaped some of the worst consequences of what we have seen during his death. Uh, but it's easy to talk about what might have been. So we don't have the option, obviously, of going back and replaying that film. It won't work. Um, but my experience with Robin, and I had the opportunity to see him almost on a weekly basis when he was Defense Minister of Israel for the three and a half years that I was there, was extremely interesting. He was a, an extremely contentious man in his outward manner. And you had to sit with him and talk uh, and push uh, to get him to understand where your views were coming from. But I never left a meeting with Robin and went back to the next meeting when at some point in the conversation he had not picked up on what I had said at the earlier meeting and put it in his own context and in his own way uh, and shaped it in a way obviously that met his needs but was clearly the answer to what it was that I had to tell him I thought he should be thinking about and doing. He was extremely interesting. Uh, an interesting question, I don't think it's a secret, uh, was that on more than one occasion during that period, it was Robin himself who came to me and said, the United States needs to pay more attention to Iran. Uh, Iran, it was after the revolution, after the mullahs, uh, after a tremendous vitriolic anti-Israeli period on the part of the Iranians. None of that seemed to bother him. What seemed to concern him was that if there was a geostrategic relationship in the region around Iran, that we had to consider it and take it into account and begin to think about how to deal with that in a way that was not just basically no contact, no relationship, uh, nothing. Uh, interesting. Uh, uh, could you elaborate why, in your view, it, it seems so difficult for American administration, this one or its previous one, to deal, have a good conversation with Iran. I'll talk about the previous one, because <laughs> I was there. Uh, and it was difficult only in a sense that we went through a very conscious effort, uh, both through private communications and public speeches, uh, to try to develop it. And, and this is what my now friend, the Iranian ambassador in New York says, was the tragedy of Iranian-American relations that whenever you were ready, we were not, and whenever we were ready, you were not. So in effect, we've had this back and forth where for one reason or another, whether it is a combination of internal politics on their side or our side, or a set of objective conditions, uh, that there were never any real efforts to move with one exception. In 2002, uh, after the fall of Afghanistan, uh, the Iranians agreed in the context of a previous UN framework created by the Secretary General around Afghanistan uh, to participate with us actively in the talks in Bonn in Germany in trying to put together what was the framework for the new government of Afghanistan. And it turned out to be a quite remarkable period and someone will have an interesting PhD thesis to write about it someday. Uh, but we had more meeting of the mind and less contention with Iran in that particular period than I think probably at any time since 78. Uh, so it is not impossible if it can work that that will happen. Um, I think that we probably have pretty much an equal sharing of the blame on this issue. Uh, and that it is not, I think, uniquely an Iranian preserve to resist talks uh, or an American one to want them and not get them. We've gone on both sides. I mentioned in my remarks uh, what I think is a 
totally misunderstood view of diplomatic contacts. That somehow by having diplomatic contacts with Iran, we are legitimatizing a government. Uh, we all know that in diplomatic practice, we've not been awarded uh, the role of world legitimatizer. It's not something, uh, we can arrogate that to ourselves if we think that we can make it happen, but it doesn't. Secondly, we all know that when you talk with a foreign government, uh, the issues that you deal with are the issues you agree upon and that you don't infer out of that particular process more than the two sides are prepared to agree when you deal with it. If you're prepared to agree, of course those contexts will establish some diplomatic relationship. But it's a process that's a process by agreement, not a process of kind of indirect uh, consequences that flow from the opportunity. But I think that there is a feeling in American domestic politics from time to time uh, at people who look at this question uh, that somehow there is a misunderstanding on that issue. Uh, maybe it is a, just a self-serving argument uh, to avoid contact for those who believe in fact that uh, the Iran uh, government is ready to drop like a ripe plum uh, into the basket of regime change. I know it's sometimes hard to look at these issues when you have a region that is so vital for conflict, but I'm wondering what you see as the prospects for real economic development in the short term and long term in Iraq and Afghanistan and even Palestine, and maybe what role U.S. foreign policy and foreign service should play and does play in that sort of economic development. Tremendously tough challenge. I think that where you have a lot of conflict going on, I think our experience, whether it has been Vietnam or now in Iraq or even in Afghanistan, the, w the ability to make really positive progress on the civilian side is very much limited and it's going to be and I think will continue to be. In other circumstances, obviously, where governments and people are not motivated to change, I think no amount of dumping foreign assistance is necessarily the answer to making that happen. We have to find with other people how and in what way they're prepared to change, where they want to go, and is that something that we can influence or play along with. It, it's not something that drops uniquely like manna from heaven uh, from the American uh, Treasury Department into the laps of foreign officials and produces the sort of change we would like to see. Um, I think over time, obviously, individuals working in foreign countries can achieve a huge amount uh, if they're properly supported and provided for, and particularly, if they have the persuasive capacities to help the local folks begin uh, to move, absorb, and take on uh, what it is that they will really need to perpetuate in their own interest. Doing it all ourselves, as you can see from my remarks, is not a formula that I think makes a lot of sense, despite what is a traditional American tendency to want to do that. It's an interesting question, I guess, asked it a lot. In a way, not all that different in a sense that I have the opportunity, indeed the pleasure of trying to stay up with what's happening around the world on a very broad basis. Um, I, I deal through offices that I've set up in about 20 countries where I've tried to find mainly significant local people uh, to help us uh, as our company local leaders. Um, and they work with foreign governments. Uh, they don't do things like sales and marketing, but they assist. They look for new opportunities for us to do work placement abroad, wherever that seems to be viable and useful. And obviously, we look clearly at what our longer-term strategies are going to be in those, in those regions. Uh, to some extent, uh, this is maybe, because I helped to design this, a mirror image of a lot of what I was doing before in attempting to apply it. Uh, to a corporate context, which is, which is somewhat different. Um, what I, I think badly underestimated uh, was the degree to which uh, moving a large corporation uh, doesn't take a large lever. <laughs> and so if you would say the foreign part 
of what I've been doing has been an awful lot easier than the domestic part uh, and moving a big company, uh, particularly one composed of very self-contained, very powerful business units uh, is a lot more difficult. Uh, but look, in the Foreign Service, we often found that sometimes up to two-thirds of our problems was with Washington. <laughs> so I've had some experience in that. <laughs> uh, I think we need to be careful in distinguishing between the settler movement that put eight or 9,000 settlers in settlements in Gaza and the Israeli public as a whole. Uh, it represents, I think, happily from my perspective as an American, a very small piece of the Israeli population and never was in a majority. Uh, secondly, most Israelis that I met and talked with in my time there and since have not seen Gaza as any part of what has traditionally been seen as Eretz Israel, uh, the land of Israel, a place where they had a, a traditional historical relationship. In fact, most saw it as an imposition. The third point is that the idea for unilateral disengagement in Gaza was first born in the Labor Party. The first time I heard about it was from then a young labor leader by the name of Chaim Ramon. He happened to be an Israeli. It happened to be very popular in Labor Party circles. It is interesting that it migrated at least to the leader of the Likud, maybe not through the party as a whole. Uh, so it is an area where Israelis, in my view, had the least attachment and perhaps the most willingness to move. It took time for that idea to percolate through Israel. But I can tell you that my belief is that if you took a poll today, 65% of Israelis would certainly line up without any hesitation and say it was the right step. And I think those 65%, one way or another, or another part of them, are probably still supportive of Sharon if he's prepared, certainly, to commit himself to continue to move on. Uh, it is a kind of Nixon in China possibility. Certainly, my views are that Sharon's motivations uh, are, in part, I think, philosophically uh, if I don't do this, and I believe, and I think he does finally, that Israel cannot stay Jewish and democratic and in permanent occupation, and that all of his old theories uh, about military force being the only effective way to deal with Arabs uh, have completely dissipated. With the disappearance of those two ideas, um, I think he's left with only one course of action to take. And, and it's interesting. I think finally he's also an uh, entirely controversial history in something of a legacy mode and something maybe of a Nixon in China mode. We'll wait and see. May be totally wrong and he may disappear without a trace uh, and someone else will come along. In the long run, it's interesting because I think those conclusions, however difficult they are, are the right conclusions and I think that a majority of Israelis probably would support those conclusions without difficulty, particularly if they had a strong leader. Uh, who was really to get out there and work for them. We have time for about two more questions. Sure. Why, in your view, is it taking so long to make the Iraqi troop so-called combat ready? I wish I knew. I don't know the answer. Um, I guess it's first in the very hard category. Secondly, it seems to me that of all the truly mindless things we did was to take an army of 400,000 men with weapons and send it out uh, into the streets with their weapons in their hands and no salary and expect that that would produce nothing uh, of consequence. And so it was, in effect, creating a fertile recruiting ground for an insurgency. 
Uh, so I think that that's difficult. Um, uh, I don't know why it's taken so long to do this training, uh, in part because maybe we're trying to do quantity over quality, and that's worried me. Uh, and I think that obviously leadership is a problem, as you have seen, and I don't disagree with this. The present Iraqi government has said those folks who took a little bath are okay and we can bring them back if they're military leaders, we can use them. And I totally agree with that. The Ba'ath Party, in my view, uh, was nothing but a coterie of Saddam psychophants. Um, and as many of you may know, the Ba'ath Party was originally invented by two Arab Christians from Syria and Lebanon. Uh, to note that this is somewhere on a dangerous scale with fascism and communism seems to me to be a complete misreading. And in fact, the two wings of the Ba'ath Party, the Syrian Ba'ath and the Iraqi Ba'ath, have been at traditional loggerheads as Syria and Iraq have been since the 8th century. And so the notion that somehow this was a contamination uh, that was ideological and extremely dangerous, it was, I think, the first denominator maybe of someone who had a relationship with the regime. Uh, but I think in most cases it was very light and probably not significant, and we can take the risk of uh, debathifying some folks and bringing them back in. Maybe they need a shower, put it that way. <laughs> I was just wondering uh, what role you think religion plays in all this? Is it sort of a fundamental uh, difference and an obstacle in any sort of negotiation, or is it more of a guise for political or economic differences? And also, uh, what has President Bush been very open about well, a hugely interesting question, and it occurs in a lot of contexts. Uh, let me begin by saying crusade is not a happy word in the Muslim <laughs> Arab world, uh, as we found out. A and maybe axis of evil is not necessarily uh, one that generates a lot of enthusiasm. It may be good domestically, and obviously all politicians have to consider that balance. I think, secondly, religion and religious ideas plays as varied idea, uh, as varied a role as there are people who believe in it or don't believe in it. And to some extent, uh, that's individual, although people also live with church dogma and discipline and ideas of that sort to one extent or another. I think it is a unifying factor for differences, whereas traditionally people looked at religions as things that practiced peace, good neighbor, neighborliness, and friendship. And to some extent, thus, it has gone from a practice that has been on the positive side to a rallying point on the negative side. And we've seen that in the history of religion over a long period of time. This is not necessarily a new feature. But it is tragic, in a sense, that that has happened because it's become a reinforcement for difference rather than the beginning of a search for common ideas and ways to move ahead. But it relates, obviously, to conflicts over territory. It relates to conflicts over holy sites. It relates to all of the problems that we see endemic in a, in a place like the Middle East. Uh, and it's not necessarily Christian, Muslim, Jew. It is also within the religions tensions and difficulties that have made for, for problems. And it doesn't make negotiations any easier. And it doesn't make difficulties um, any uh, more rapidly solved. Uh, Henry Kissinger used to say that the difficult and intractable I can deal with tomorrow, but those who get their instructions from God will take a little longer. <laughs> How would you define the United States self-interest in the Middle East? And to what extent has our involvement in Iraq uh, contributed or hurt that? Yeah, I would say peace, stability, oil or access to energy are three of the things that probably are very important. Below that, a whole panoply of trading relations, historical alliances, and things of that sort. Uh, I could see uh, back in 2003, uh, if you'd offered me an equation that said, I can see Mr. Saddam Hussein gone and a wonderful new bright democratic Iraq coming up on the horizon. And I can do this for you all uh, in you know, 15 days of military campaign and 
three months of, oper uh, uh, of, of occupation, I could see that as a beguiling prospect. The real problem is I'm not around buying the Brooklyn Bridge anymore. Uh, and the notion that if you spent 15 minutes in the Middle East, you were not there with 400 questions about whether that proposition would work, uh, as beguiling as it was, I think would uh, clearly be something you'd want to question seriously. And so I think that's the, the frame. Uh, sure, uh, I'm happy to see Saddam gone, uh, but I would like to see it happen in a way that doesn't produce more costs and risks at the end than we started with. And that's easy to say in hindsight. I understand that Monday morning quarterbacking is something that is a art form in Washington. Uh, but nevertheless, I think knowing what was out there, uh, many of us contributed to reports and studies that were published before the Iraq war that raised a number of these questions. And so it isn't purely Monday morning quarterbacking that we're engaged in. And I think that that has to obviously be looked at in the context that you raise it.